Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. What's up? And welcome to the Social Jello with Angelo podcast, Conversations with a Backfist. Today I'm here with Dwight Woods. Um, he's with the he's the host and producer, is that correct? Of yep. the Jikundo Dialogues and the I Love Jikundo podcast. All right. I hate to cut this short, everyone. I'm still here with Dwight, and me and Dwight are about to continue to talk about a great subject. What is success in martial arts? But <laughs> so for me, going back to what my dad told me growing up, he was an entrepreneur and he saw the arts. He saw the arts as something you do. He wasn't against art and he wasn't against sport. He was actually very athletic, water skied, uh, jet skied, uh, wakeboarded, uh, body, uh, bodyboarding at the beach. I learned how to surf. He had nothing. He had no problem with athletics. Right. But he just had this thing that if you're going to shoot for something to make money, make sure it's something that you know you're going to make money with. Like, don't take the risk of going, be an entrepreneur, but be an entrepreneur in something that you know is going to pay the bills. And yeah. then, some. And then well, I grabbed his philosophy. He hated my philosophy. My philosophy was make as much money as you can in as little time as possible. That was my philosophy. He hated that because he was like, nine to five, you work hard with your hands. <laughs> That's really important. Right. Your hands have to get dirty. He hated people that came home with clean hands. So those people didn't really work. <laughs> those people didn't work that day. So like, so, <laughs> like, so like, I'm like, all right, look. So he hated my philosophy at first. Later in his life, before he died, he, he finally figured out where I was going with it. Um, so for me, and then my instructor, my instructor, uh, now professor, back then Sifu, Ronnie Sigiri, he always told me something similar. He didn't say don't open a school. Mm-hmm. He just said it's really difficult to run oh, a school. Yeah. It's oh, really yeah. difficult. He'd always talk about it. It's really difficult to run a school. It's it really is. tough. And he didn't never tell me not to do it. He would just very candidly tell me what he was going through running a school. We would move schools. And eventually when I started with him, he had a big school. And then uh, I, I'm not going to share where he's at now because you know, all this stuff has happened. But I will say that as time went by, he no longer had a big school. And he decided that for him, the easiest thing was going to a rec center. He said, hey, this is great. I don't have to worry about the overhead. Right. I don't like the idea that they kind of, I have to charge a certain amount that they're telling me, like they're only gonna, like I have to charge this amount to pay the fees because there's rec fees. And then I have to charge this much to make some money. So that bothered him, which is why he still always would teach at the park or at his backyard of his house to continue Mm -hmm. to, because he always had this like, need because we were in a rough neighborhood and and he would literally we were always working with kids at risk youth as they like to say um so and i was an at risk youth that's for damn sure so like (laughs) so like (laughs) or maybe i wasn't at risk but other people were at risk and i was a danger to myself and others so i'm glad he came in my life so like so so we always had that element there for that kind of a person and um so I still saw that, and I was always wary to open my own school. I was like, Ey. like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna continue to do. Well, kind of my instructor had his he had his full time job, and then he went on. So as as I move forward, like people on on Facebook see my gym, and maybe their assumption is that I have some sort of big school because it looks really nice. But to be completely honest. I made that for myself. And I said that to my students all the time. I made this space for myself and I'm just sharing it with everyone else. My main job is like, I don't know if I mentioned that before. I think I mentioned to my people before, like I teach ESL in Japan. I have an English school. It makes, it makes enough. I don't want to, I don't know how it makes enough. I don't like to disclose numbers. I'm comfortable. And I've stuck to my philosophy of making as much money as I could in as little as time needed to do it which allows me to train every day um i wish i can keep my school open i I wish i can teach classes at night but that's the one time i work 
is that in the evenings, but I'm always available during the day. So my school is open seven days a week. And the one day that I'm not there, um, cause I'm comfortable, cause I make enough money. Cause I grab my dad's philosophy of, I don't care if I work every day, but I'm going to make as much money in as little time possible. I eventually that flipped over to the point where um, I have my job. I don't hate it. I don't love it. It's not like I'm not, I don't love it. Like I do the martial arts, but I don't hate it. It's actually pretty easy to teach kids ESL. So like I do my job and then I have all this free time to spend with my family and also to spend doing martial arts, which I do every day. So like, this is where I get kind of, I know that some people, and I've talked to some martial artists um, and I'll mention a conversation. I had one martial artist and I'm not going to say his name, but he knows that if he's listening, he knows this is the conversation we had, you know, for him, he has, he, he came from a different background. He worked as a, I think he worked for a really big company doing something to do with computers, maybe like software engineering or something. He hated his job and he decided to become a coach. Um, he decided to go into his Kaji Kimo background to become a, a martial arts instructor. I'm not going to say word coach because it's going to give away who he is. So, <laughs> so <laughs> he decided to do private lessons as a martial arts instructor and he, that's how he pays his bills. So he's got kind of a mindset of a working mindset for the martial arts. Like I work at this time yeah. and he'll always, he's still very open like he would never charge he would never nickel and dime anyone but he does take vacations and time off right because he's older and he's got to do what he's got to do so again going back to the kaji Kimbo doesn't have rules uh, that's I, I i the zen i guess like you do it that way i do it this way it's all good mm -hmm. but for me personally i got called by a student here's an example yesterday and he was laughing when he when he said that i said hey check this out this this text message saturdays are my day off i train six days a week and the one day I don't train is Saturday just to, I, I turned 40 this month and I know what's coming. So <laughs> I, I know training seven days a week is definitely not feasible as I start approaching 40, okay. but, but uh, this always happens where I get to that day off and I'm like, I'll go for a run. Or like I got a text from a, my student. Hey, I want to do some BJJ tomorrow. Is that cool? I'm like, oh, that's my day off, but it's only an hour. Come on over. <laughs> I'll come on over. I'm working, but I'll, I'll be out of work at this time. So just come over and we'll roll for an hour. And, and, and it's all good because I kind of want to train. I always want to train. <laughs> right. Right. And if there's something to trade with, I'll do it. And, um, and I charge ridiculously uh, low amounts of money to do my training because, like I said, I'm comfortable. And... I don't need the income from martial right. arts. Right. And, yeah. and I almost worry that if I have that mindset, I'm afraid that I will start looking at my martial arts as work. And cause I do that every day that can get scary. Cause like, I'm afraid that I'll feel like I'm going to work. If that makes any sense. I don't think that'll ever happen, but I fear that it if I sound to me like it would. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it'll ever happen, yeah. but yeah. I always fear the day that, I would feel like I'm going to work when I'm going to go train. Cause I'm like my mindset from the first time I started training to right now is exactly the same. I'm just right. excited every yeah. time. I'm like that, that white belt that comes in and wants to do something new. Yeah. So like, yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I don't know if I answered your question, if I just <laughs> I made it there's, more convoluted. There's, no, there, there's, 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 there's nothing wrong with enjoying what you do no matter what it is whether it's work or play there's there's absolutely how it can't be wrong to to enjoy it if you're in a position where where look you're actually in a position where they can both be work right you could one day decide you know what i'm going to make this martial art thing as professional as it can be it do doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're not going to enjoy it. It doesn't mean that, right? Because, yeah, because, because it, look, the thing about, about making money is that money is a tool, right? So, so there's no, there's no need to start worshiping a tool, right? Wait, so if you recognize it for what it is, it's something that you use, you, you make use of it to do whatever. That, that nowhere is that a recipe for chasing after it. 
you know, for becoming the kind of person where all you can do, no, but there's nothing wrong with being well compensated for whatever it is that you do. And so if people are willing to pay what you ask them to pay, because you don't, you don't put a gun to anybody's head and say, become my student. All right. So if you're, if you're well enough recognized and people believe that you are worth what you charge, you see, and I think sometimes some people are afraid of that. They're afraid to put themselves out there because they're not sure if they can really, you know, come up to speed, if, if they're really at a level where whatever, whatever. So they won't do it. And if they see somebody else doing it, then they'll, they'll criticize that person. And they're criticizing them simply out of the fear that they can't do the same thing. I just, right? I just and, read that. I just read something very similar to what you just said in a book called uh, Stop Doing That Shit. That's the name <laughs> of the book. That, <laughs> the, the, the Road to Ending Self-Sabotage. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, Stop yeah stop doing and, and for anybody listening it's a great book it's called stop doing that shit um written by let me see here so for anybody who's looking for a self-help book it's pretty good written by a psychologist uh gary john bishop yeah stop okay. doing that shit and self-sabotage and demand your life back is that but <laughs> that that's a very modern title it's you know, a very modern the, title the old the old title would have been something like end end self-sabotage yeah. by joe vitale right? yeah <laughs> yeah that's a very modern title right there yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah right oh, that, 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 that's that that's the kind of like the self sabotaging self negative behaviors those those subconscious behaviors yeah, that we have in our head yeah. that stop us from uh, from going after what we might right. otherwise see, do, right? If we weren't so, so now here's the thing. See, if as a professional martial artist you realize that self sabotage is something that afflicts a huge percentage of the population, you can then market yourself as an ally, right? Against self sabotage. That's what your martial, that's one of the benefits of training in martial art with you. So now you're able to position yourself somewhere as opposed to, I'm a karate teacher. <laughs> karate teachers are a dime a dozen. You see? So if you market yourself as a karate teacher, if you think of yourself as a karate teacher, then okay, you'll be a dime a dozen. But when you learn the strategies to improve your own self-image, to improve the way you think about yourself, and then you develop the courage to put yourself out there, to run the risk, right? And you, and you, you position yourself as something other than a mere karate teacher. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. When you do stuff like that, so what was Bruce Lee? A kung fu actor. Do we yeah. talk about all the kung fu actors 50 years after they died? <laughs> no, we don't, right? But, because Bruce Lee did not position himself as merely a kung fu actor. Right. So, like, you, but you say you're touching on something very similar here, right? So, Bruce Lee had his career, his job that took care of the bills, took care of what he wanted. And in his yeah. case, he converged. He he did the, the trifecta of converging. Bruce Lee goal. followed. Bruce Lee followed your philosophy. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm, I'm followed, not going to say that. I'm not going to say that because I, Lee, he's, I'll, I'll say. It. I'll say. It. <laughs> Bruce Lee followed your philosophy to make as much money as quickly as possible, right? Because you make your money slowly. If you're making your money one student at a time, right? One new student at a time in your school. If you make a movie and you put your message in into the movie, guess what? Right? You make a ton of money. And then there's a thing called royalties, right? So you continue to make money in perpetuity. 
and you're still able to put your message out there. And Bruce Lee's martial art message was not watered down at all because he positioned himself as a legitimate martial artist and a martial arts actor. You see, so had he lived all the all the Bruce Lee books that are out there by by the great John Little. Imagine if Bruce Lee might have gone on to publish those things himself. You know what I mean? So he would have been an author, an actor, a, a producer and director of uh, I mean, come on. He would have been right? like the, the Jay Z. Yeah, yeah, of the, of the martial arts world, right? He would. He was <laughs> arguably he, was he is. He, he is. He's just not around your, anymore, right? <laughs> Angela, he was following your philosophy, man. Yeah, I mean, and, that, and, that, and that's like, and we're not. I like to say, like, I almost feel bad, and I say almost because I don't, but I almost <laughs> feel bad because I don't. <laughs> I don't feel bad. I'm learning to not feel bad because. Because again, if for anybody listening to this, I started. Let's go back to what I said. I was a, at, I was a, a risk to myself and others. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make a lot of money. I came from a really bad place, but it worked out. So like as as things came out, it worked out. And now, like I see this conversation, like in the GKD community, the idea that you shouldn't make money or you should make money in the Kaji Kimbo community, it, the that conversation is had, and it's. We don't frown upon people with big schools, but there is like an unsaid model of what some people think it should be yeah. and what it shouldn't be, but they don't really argue about it. But I just, I hope my listeners and my Kaja Kembo Ohana, you kind of see that I feel that both sides have a reason to be the way they are, right? right. The, the person that wants to teach in the backyard and not charge much, and then the person running. So in Kaju Kembo, this is the one difference between Kaju Kembo and JKD. So Kaju Kembo is an acronym, right? Karate, ju judo, judo right. jujitsu, ken, kempo, kung fu, bo, right. boxing. boxing. Yeah. That acronym, Kaju Kembo guys end up going in a direction from. So if someone will create a base in one of, some part of this acronym. And that's why you see someone like Stefan. <laughs> <laughs> Kessing, who's who's decided to go all Jew, right? Oh, that mm -hmm. sounded bad. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded really bad. I don't think Jiu Jitsu. That. I'm not editing that out, but I meant Jiu Jitsu <laughs> for context, <laughs> right? He decided to go all Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. People don't even know him as a Kaju Kimbo guy anymore. Right. Um, a lot of Kaju Kimbo guys do this. And um, the bread and butter for a lot of Kaju Kimbo guys is the ka for karate. They'll put black geese on and, and they'll teach. They'll even, they, they'll, some of them will just put karate on the window because that's what brings people into the school. Because mm -hmm. again, we don't have these rules. Like, our community doesn't have these rules. Like the, the saying that you can't make money, or you can't be karate or can't be a style. You can. In fact, a lot of our guys have black belts in other arts. Ah, okay. Um, They'll come in maybe with a black belt. Right now, I got a guy who's, uh, what is he? He's like, a, he's a black belt. And I think Go Ryu Karate. Go Either Go Juru yeah. or, or some style of Okinawan Karate. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he, he he heard about Kaju Kembo and how it, the, some of the roots are from Okinawan Karate. And he, stuck, he came into my place because they did some YouTube. So I had some other Japanese karate guys come in and train with us. Mm -hmm. And they're like, are you teaching Jeet Kune Do? And I'm like, nope, I'm teaching Kaju Kembo. They're like, well, some of this stuff looks like Jeet Kune Do. I'm like, that's good for you guys. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm happy that the, the JKD guys are, are, are doing are doing parries and blocks and strikes. That's awesome. I'm just teaching you some parries, some blocks, and some strikes. Right. So yeah. let, let's not go there. But um, but then this guy joins. So like, he's already got a black belt, right. and he keeps asking me, "Well, like, so going through the system, how how does this work? Like, I'm gonna." Like, I mean, obviously he's okay starting as a white belt but as he goes through obviously his base is karate so this guy can finish he can literally finish and we have no rules in Kaju Kembo to say that this guy finishes I give him his black belt I know he earns his black belt no, nothing's given everything's earned he earns his black belt he passes the test and he, I give him a certificate and he can turn around and keep 
teaching his karate with some his own concepts that he comes up with because we encourage our students to come up with their own concepts mm -hmm. as they, as they teach their 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 kaju kenbo as we say mm -hmm. and he can pretty much have a student that looks very different from one of my students and we're all okay with that right because it's part of that acronym and even a little outside of the acronym right now lately are the fma guys the fma guys don't really fit this acronym but the founder did was filipino right. so we're kind of like nah. he I was mean, filipino I and, mean, come on yeah if you want to go on. there and here's pictures of him holding the sticks so Filipi like, filipinos <laughs> in hawaii right i mean come on yeah yeah it's, so uh, it look it's in there Maybe yeah. it's not in the name, right? Maybe yeah. it's not in the acronym, but I certainly would not be surprised to hear that Kaju, Kaju Kembo has a weapons component. Yeah, and then, and, and then and, some of the, and, and, and a lot of the guys, because they do, all this cross-training keeps happening, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't have the rules. Right? <laughs> we have the acronym, but we don't have the rules. So some of the guys will go train with JKD guys. Some of the guys will go train yeah. with and, and earn their certificates in this other art yeah. and then come back and show us what yeah. they're doing. So it's interesting. I think that's why we don't, we do amongst each other, we argue about it, but in the general public, we don't mm -hmm. as far as what someone does with it. So that that's why like, I, I think it's interesting when you mentioned some of the JKD stuff and I'll probably grab parts of this interview because it's, it's going longer than I thought it would and I'll make shorts from it so people can kind of hone in on some of these subjects but like I think it's interesting that in the GKD community there's like that unsaid rule about martial arts success and a dojo and and that kind of stuff so I guess yeah it's it's because there 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 are people from different generations and and then there are the 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 students or the followers of people from those different generations. And some people just have that idea behind it, right? That it's automatic. If you try to, if you try to make money at it, you're automatically selling out. And, you, you know, it, it, um, it, can be a, it, it can be a struggle for some people. It was almost for me in the beginning, but I was fortunate enough to have business mentors who taught me a different way of looking at it. And when I, when I analyzed what they, what they were talking about, I realized that Bruce Lee himself was a commercial success. And once I have that recognition, once I realize that, once I have that realization, then there's no stopping me. See, look, here's the thing, right? I, 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 I wanted to say this to you earlier. It doesn't matter which path you take. Here's what matters. Do it with honor. That's it. Do whatever it is you want to do. Do it however it is that you want to do. In Kaju Kembo, in JKD, in whatever. Just freaking do it with honor, man done and i think that's where because remember oh I, I forgot to mention this i should have said this first here <laughs> i should have said this first i was originally looking for jkd ah i was originally looking for jkd why am i talking more where, where? Gonna, in, in california and, and the reason i didn't mention this earlier because I, I, I i'm going to grab the first half of this podcast and have it be all about you <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> And then I'm making it all about me. No, <laughs> but, but no, at the other half, we're going to have a dialogue conversation where we, we both share time a little more. But yeah, when I first started, I was in, I was in Escondido, California, which was okay. far away from any JKD schools. I didn't know where to find a JKD school. This is a little bit. What internet, year was it? What, internet, what year was it? Internet 19... 1999 1996 95 so okay. internet was around but we didn't have a computer so where 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 i so i don't i so 
when it comes to California. Oh, it's near San Diego, know- San Diego County. Okay. San Diego. If you know Los Angeles, it was two hours away from Los Angeles. So I okay. knew there was a lot of JKD people in Los Angeles. Yeah, but, but I think in 99, Roy Harris was already in San Diego. Probably in central San Diego, like the city. Okay. I was out. I knew there was okay. JKD guys in the city. In LA. Yeah. Like in okay. LA. Oh, okay. I knew there was guys in the city of San Diego. I lived in the outskirts where right. where um because it got more expensive as you go in so i lived in a, in in the poorer neighbor po- poorer suburb outside of that and didn't have a computer to even search for it so i had to very i've taught i've told my listeners this story too many times so i'm just gonna s- catch you up to speed without going into too many details so i don't bore them with the same story again <laughs> but um but yeah i all you know similar to you i watched a lot of a lot of no i watched a lot of karate and kung fu movies my cousin introduced me to Bruce Lee, um, and we started just training mm-hmm. uh, off our notes. Very mm-hmm. similar to you, a lot of books. Yeah. I can't yeah. even remember the titles. I can't remember the authors. I would just go to the library and pick up a stack of books on on whatever, whatever. Yeah. I didn't care. Boxing. Yeah. Um, uh, I picked up a copy of of uh, of the of the Tao of Jeet mm-hmm. Kune Do. Mm-hmm. Started going through it, but I didn't own it. I was at the library, so like I would read it and look at the notes and then go back to my other notes and just notes and notes and had a little fight club with my friends that came from different places as well. By the time I walked into the Kaju Kebo place, I said, I went to a Kung Fu school, started in Choi Foot. Mm-hmm. And um, later in history, I find out that Choi Foot was the opposite of, was, they were like rivals with Wing Chun, right? I had no idea. But at the time, I didn't care. I didn't know, didn't care. Just wanted to learn how to defend myself. I needed right. to defend myself against multiple opponents with weapons. That's what I needed. I needed combatives. I needed. I needed. Uh, I needed psycho. I needed psychology to figure out how to not get shot. So like, mm-hmm. that's what I was navigating. That's what I was reading. Mm-hmm. So like, when I got to the Trolley Foot place, was greedy. <laughs> ah! <laughs> <There> it <is. laughs> I was sixteen. 16, 17. I was 17. Going to turn 18 soon. I started at 17. I enjoyed the training. At that point, I was already sparring. I already had a whole, our group, I was 17. Right. And our group was just a, a mix of, uh, of, uh, of black belts and karate. Um, my cousin uh, and me who just never joined, but just learned basics in boxing, kickboxing, grappling. We didn't even know. We called it judo um and it wasn't like the joke judo no that kind of stuff but it, was like, it, was, it, was, it wasn't that 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 old joke but yeah it, we, we call it judo because that's all we that's all we could really call it and then when we'd yeah. spar we had very 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 little rules and we sparred in my front yard and i didn't have a mat so we put a carpet in my front yard we put a carpet with several layers of foam so it okay. was similar to a mat so that if right. people fell on the ground they can grapple and then, um, and there was a tree and we would punch the tree. If you, if you were sparring, if you got hit into the tree. That was just it's there. It's so, yeah. so like, yeah, that was our thing. We would do that. So by the time I got into that Charlie foot place, I already, I already had a lot of sparring under my, under my belt. I had a lot of fighting under my belt, not professionally, just. Right. Just but like, why, why did you think you, why did you feel that you needed to go to a place? I'd never been to a place. <laughs> I okay. never been to a place. <laughs> that was the answer. Like, so my friend, oh, I had a friend who said, I want to start training, but I see what you guys are doing, and that looks scary. I kind of <laughs> <laughs> I'll be very I had and I'm, okay. just, gonna, I'm just gonna say okay. it. I, I had a white friend. I didn't have a lot of white friends growing up. So like, <laughs> I had my one white friend, Ch- Chad. And it's funny that on the internet now, like Chad is like this, this is like stereotype of a white guy named Chad. Chad, <laughs> Chad, my friend Chad was like, I see what you guys are doing. And I'm, you know, I, we, I, I want to do something like, I want to do it right. I've been right. doing all this, this like looking at it and this, this is the best. I think we, I want to go to an authentic Kung Fu school. Okay. And, um, and I found this place. So we went to this place and I was like, okay, that's cool. I like the instructor. Um, started training six months in. I got my ACL torn, uh, the short uh, story, 
I was drinking with a friend, one of our guys, <laughs> one of our guys that we'd spar with sometimes. We were drinking, we were, drinking, we were teenagers, and um, he's like, hey, man, in Taekwondo, they showed us this, this thing, this takedown thing. I'm like, all right, cool, show it to me. And he's like, well, I'll show it. I went to this Kung Fu class, and they showed me this thing called a horse stance and a cat stance. Check this out. He's like, oh, go into that cat stance real quick. See, this is useless, because, like, if you did it this way, I'd do this, and then, like, uh, and then, the, the, then my ACL got torn. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so, so I go back to that school, and I'm, I paid. I paid for a year of training uh, up front. At uh, that point, I was already working as a, I was working for my dad as a mechanic, okay. an advertising agency, uh, delivering papers and writing up classified ads. So they cashed you out. So yeah, they ca- I paid for a year of training ahead of time, which my dad told me that's stupid. You shouldn't go like before I even went because he had to sign a way he had to sign the paperwork and he's like, okay. I'm not going to sign this this is a waste of money. You shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, it's my money. It's my money, my problem. And he's like, all right, fine. As long as it's your money, your problem. He signed it. And I, and I, and I, I gave him my, my thousand, a thousand dollars for a year of training up, up front. Mm-hmm. Um, and I came in six months later, uh, six months later, I come in limping and I'm like, I know. Cause when I signed there, it said no sparring or training outside of class on the crown track. So I'm like, I knew not to tell them it happened that way. So I told him, hey, you know, I got hurt. You know, yeah, I, you know, I, I was skateboarding and I got hurt. And they're like, okay, well, that's cool. Um, but, you know, you kind of paid for the year. So if you'd like, you can come in, you can watch class. You know, you know, we will allow you to observe class for six months. I'm like, well, is there any way I'll do that? That's fine. I can observe class. But is there any way that since I can't really train, is it okay if this six months we can prorate it for the next year because I already gave you a thousand dollars for this year. Can we at least say that I have six months paid and I'll continue? I'll come in if, if that's what you want to do. I'll come in with my with my uh, with my crutches and, and I'll sit here and watch watch you people train <laughs> with my friend Chad. He'll he'll give you a ride, and then um and after that you know six months down the line I'll start up again. And they said no, you have to give us another thousand dollars for that. And that's when I was like, well, I can't afford that. And I'm not going to do that. Sorry. And that's, yeah. that was the end of that. So after that, I was just really bitter, more bitter now than I was. I was never bitter. Now I was bitter. <laughs> now I was bitter about established places. Right. And so we fast forward to when I meet my Kaja Kembo instructor and the guy who tore my ACL <laughs> is the one who introduced me to him no way yeah oh he was he felt horrible the next day <laughs> but, but anyway so did i mean I did he join too he trained kaju kembo too so he would he never joined anything he always would train a little bit at one place train a little bit place train another place also a, a big fan of bruce lee but never joined anything okay never stayed away never stayed anywhere too long um his story <laughs> so like i meet my instructor my i, I my instructor tells me at that point, I've already done, I'd, I'd like to come in to those places for two weeks for the yeah. two week trial lesson. Yeah. And in the first two weeks, I'd ask them, okay, so when do you guys do your sparring? What kind of sparring do you do? And if they said anything like, we don't allow you to spar. And I told them, well, yeah, I've, already, I've got some experience. I don't know how to do light contact. And if they said I couldn't spar, I would walk right out and I wouldn't join. I wouldn't even stick around for the two weeks. Mm-hmm. My instructor, when I asked him the same question, hey, when do you guys spar? He's like, this Friday. I'm like, what are the rules? Whatever you want them to be. All right. Who? What kind of people are there? So I got small guys, big guys. You know, whatever you want. And then, um, and I was like, so what's Kaju Kembo anyway? And he says, you see that stick over there? You see that tree? You're like, yeah. So I can jump up there and break that branch off and whoop your ass with it. <laughs> and I look at him. And I look at him. Start laughing. And then I'm laughing. And there's a guy standing behind him named Mike. Later, later in my in my in my martial arts journey, I find out that his name was Sifu Mike. But there's this big guy named Mike, and this is like back when Michael Jordan was huge, right? And he was yeah. tall, like six two. Yeah. And he's just sitting there, and he's not smiling. He's going like this. I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> I, I think this guy's not joking around. So, like, <laughs> so, so I go in there and um, I get my ass kicked, and it was so much fun. So like. That was how I got into Kaju Kembo. 
that's how that's that's how I got started. It was it was very free formatted. And that guy that I mentioned earlier that tore my ACL, he actually ended up becoming my first student. So ah. like to kind of like so he finally joined something. He finally joined something. What is yeah. it? What is it? What would you say if somebody asked you, what is it about Kaju Kembo that made you stick to it? My instructor. Ah, interesting. I would say my instructor and the way he ran things. Because I could have very easily ended up at another Kaju Kembo school. No offense to the way that other people ran, run things. Mm -hmm. And if I would have ran into a, a very karate oriented school, I would have probably walked out. But it was the way my instructor was just. And then later I found out there was lots of people like my instructor in Kaju Kembo. Not to say that I, I just, that's what ended up, I guess the way most, because I can't say all, I don't want to generalize, but the way most Kaju Kembo schools, when you come in, um, they'll generally let you be you. Right. Generally, most Kaju Kembo schools do this. If you come in and you say you did something else, they don't frown on they don't frown on you for it. Right. And they just let you train. And that's it. It's all about just coming in and training and, and mixing it up, as they say. There's always like okay. a hard element of Kaju Kembo there. That's what attracted me to Kaju Kembo, even though it wasn't Jeet Kune Do. I was like, right. hey. It's not Jeet Kune Do. I don't know what it is because I didn't even look it up, right? I wasn't looking for Kaju Kembo. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I gave up looking for Jeet Kune Do because I was already kind of sour on the experience of that place. I gave up looking for anything. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do me and yeah. take care of what I got to take care of. And I don't care. This book that I picked up a long time ago said it doesn't matter whether I join something or not as long as I follow what myself like as long as i follow and truly express myself is yeah. what matters right and that's yeah. that's what i always stuck to and then i ended up finding kaju kembo so <laughs> what, what what um okay so i got another question for you about kaju kembo what is the um i got two questions for you <laughs> what's the essential structure behind the art okay we'll start you see okay Right. You get me. I mean, like, is it percentages of of everything or or what's the essential structure behind it? So so here, here's it, it, like <laughs> I really. OK, so I'm going to have to tag it. This video This is going to be the second part of our podcast. It's going to be a tag here. What is Kaju Kembo? Because <laughs> it's actually a question amongst Kaju Kembo artists that we try to avoid because we all have a different answer for it. And people will start <laughs> fighting and arguing and say, that's not Kaji Kembo. This is, what is that yeah. guy talking about? What do you mean? So like, right. we've had that happen. But for me, okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm very careful. I've gone into the what is Kaji Kembo so many times on this podcast. But right. I think it's great. I'm sharing it with you as a, as a JKD. You're a JKD guy. So I'm going to share with you from a JKD guy uh, to a GKD guy. What is Kaji Kembo? Again. Anybody listening is like, oh, shit, again. Yes, again, we're going to go over this to my listeners. Okay, so it's not, it's based on, for me, I'm going to be very specific. My specific right. Kaju Kimbo program, and I'll tell you how I was taught, and I'll tell you how I teach it. Okay. I was taught primarily a lot of striking, a lot of karate, a little bit of judo. A lot of wushu, because my particular instructor had a second certificate in wushu kung fu, mm -hmm. and his his instructor, Grandmaster Shizual in Abad, was a golden dragon, I believe. I got these ranks right in Hungwar. So he came from that system and incorporated into Kaju Kembo. Well, he did Kaju Kembo first, and then got into that system. That's a long story. I don't want to go there right now. But so that's where my instructor came from. Was a lot of wushu, which I thought was really cool. Right. And, my, and my instructor always was going to JKD seminars, mixing that into our stuff. Ah. And that's what I thought was really cool. I'm like, hey, this is really cool. And my instructor worked with JKD guys. So okay. I was like, all right, that's really cool. I see some of the JKD here. Mm -hmm. So I, that, that's another thing that made me stay from my instructor. I, right. was, I said, this is every Kaji Kimbo instructor will give you a different story. Okay. And then there's the bow for boxing. So my instructor, uh, Sifu Mike, huge unboxing, big 
Roy Jones Jr. fan. Okay. And he loved incorporating the head movement of Roy Jones Jr. in our continuous and point sparring. I hated point sparring. But the way they introduced me to point sparring and convinced me to do point sparring was don't look at this as fighting. Look at this as a drill. It's just a practice drill. We're just trying ah, to figure out how to, how, to, how to create maximum speed, the least amount of telegraphic movement, and land your first hit on your opponent. Then the continuous sparring is what we do after that first hit. But we, the, the point sparring, just look at it as a practice drill on just landing an impactful, quick right. hit to stun your opponent and then follow through with everything else we taught you. So that's how I, I looked at point sparring. So I'm like, okay, cool. You're not telling me that, you're not telling me this other stuff like from this, these other karate, one hit, one kill, and it's done and you're going to win. I'm like that just didn't make sense to me. So like, okay, cool. I, I could get that. So I grabbed that. And then I continued my journey. I ended up doing MMA. And as soon, I, I did fine. And Hackleman talks about this. A Kaju Kembo guy, if allowed to do Kaju Kembo in MMA, would be would get this. Well, they're not allowed to do Kaju Kembo in MMA. They'd be immediately disqualified. It would, it would be like maybe one minute into the fight, we'd, we'd end up pairing into an eye poke, which they don't allow. They don't even allow you to have your hands out like this anymore. You have to have your hands here in, in the UFC. They made a new rule recently because people were pairing like this and people were getting eye poked all the time, unintentionally. Right. And, and I don't want to be like, if anybody's watching this, I don't want to be one of those, like, oh, I'll tiger claw you in the face and that's how I'd win any fight. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, that an eye poke hurts a lot. <laughs> if you've ever been <laughs> poked in the eye, fucking hurts. <laughs> I don't recommend it. I don't even recommend you practice it just to see. Don't even try. It's going to, if you do this long enough, it's going to happen. You're going to hate it. You're going to think your eye fell out. You're going <laughs> to want to go to the doctor immediately. It sucks. So like there, there are safety goggles, you know, they are. Yeah. There are safety goggles. <laughs> if you're going to practice high pokes, right? please wear safety. Yes. I, uh, that's a whole other podcast. What, the, what to yeah. wear when doing combatives. And yes. <laughs> it's yep. a, but yeah. So like in, immediately i found when i got into mma the sport of mma i always trained with mma guys but i always i never i never played by their game by their rules because i was like again i don't play by the rules i'm you guys want to spar we'll spar but we spar my version we are going to get rid of eye pokes so that no one gets right. extremely hurt but we're going to keep the growing shots um we're going to keep everything else we're just going to get rid of the any the we're just going to get rid of the one thing that can put us in the hospital right now so um I would spar with them. But then when I actually did, when I did my first MMA tournament, they, that was, that was a, that was a mess. <laughs> that was a fucking mess. So they, they said it was going to be anything goes. Cause right now, and I, I, at the time I never watched MMA. So I had no idea. Okay. I never watched MMA. Turns out I was trading, I was trading with MMA guys. I just saw MMA as a sport. Never knew about. I heard about the Gracies because my one of my guys talked about it, but again, never really heard of it. Did grappling, new triangle chokes, new arm bars, knew everything they were doing, just never really thought to look into it. Right. So when I went to my first tournament and they said, "Hey, we're doing this. We're doing this quote unquote mixed martial arts tournament." And I looked at the rules. I'm like, "Oh, they're doing Kaju Kembo. They're allowing." Anything but eye pokes, and that's it. No biting, scratching, eye pokes. And they have one more rule. That's it. That's all they had. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Sign me up. I'll go. Right. So in the very first match, I – oh, and then they did this. All ranks. In other words, white belts with black belts, no ranks. Ranks don't matter. Okay. I'm like, all right, cool. Uh, at the time, I was like, I think a blue belt in Kaju Kembo. I'm like, all right, that's fine. Whatever. So we go in. And um, the first guy I go up against, I end up hitting him with a sidekick to the ribs. And he flies out of the, of the, of the, oh, oh no mats on a basketball court 
Wooden what? basketball court auditorium. <laughs> I should probably mention this because that's probably pertinent. Yeah, that, uh... <laughs> Obviously, these guys were not, again, they weren't trying to do MMA. They were a bunch yeah. of kung fu guys, karate yeah. guys, kickboxing guys that were like, we're going to do something different. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. But <laughs> so you see how it was so like they had this idea, we're gonna do something different. Right. These Hungar guys, we're gonna do something different than this okay. MMA stuff. It's not a sport. Not so, necessarily <laughs> smart, but different. But no, dude, no, no. <laughs> so I sidekick that first guy, and he falls and bounces off that basketball court, and um he gets back up and he's hurt, and he's and they're like, Can you continue? He's like, I can continue. All right. And then um I come in with a spinning hook kick that I thought would land his head and he turned into it and I broke his nose Oh man! and they pull him off on a stretcher. So that's the first fight. <laughs> so the refs come up. That was the first fight of the day. <laughs> like, <okay. laughs> and literally like when I sp- when I did that hook kick on him, my, my, my now wife at the time, girlfriend screams. Ah! And I thought I got hurt. I'm like, what happened? What happened? Am I okay? Because <laughs> I she screamed for the other guy. <laughs> she felt so bad for him. So like they pull him off of the stretcher. The referee's coming up. All right, everyone. Uh, we'd like to make an announcement. We are no longer going to allow full contact for the rest of this match. <laughs> for the rest of the for, for the rest of the fights, we'd like to bring in a new rule. We are going to do controlled contact. We will still allow everything else that we mentioned. But we are no longer going to allow full contact. Thank you for participating. Let's go on to our next match. <laughs> so, like, uh, so then the next match comes in. My sparring partner, who comes from a karate background, um, Dan, uh, Dan Mercado, he's, God bless his soul, he, he passed away. But he comes in, and the guy comes in for what, like, they go into a melee, and he's doing some parrying and some punching. And the guy kind of comes in for like a double leg. So he immediately grabs him like we do in Kaji Kembo since we're wearing the geese. And that guy was wearing a t-shirt. He grabs his t-shirt, sweeps him, throws him onto the ground and just starts ground pounding him right then and there. And he's going light. He's not going hard. He's going off control. He's not punching him in the face. He's hitting him to the body. He's like, okay, we can do, they said controlled punches to the face and then we can still hit the body as hard as we want. So he's just pounding him in the body and they stop the fight. The guy's like, the guy starts going like this and like tapping and they stop the fight. They get the guys back up. Um, they ask the guy, can you continue? He's like, I can't continue. He's like grabbing onto his ribs. So then the referees come out again. We'd like to announce that we're no longer going to allow grappling or takedowns for the rest of this match to continue. <laughs> so this continued. This kept happening. <laughs> For each Kaji Kimball guy that went up, they right. kept making new rules. So, so by at the very the, at the very end, it was at just the very end. It was it was me. It was me and this other guy that made it to the end. And now we're pretty much just doing kickboxing with no leg kicks because another because one of the guys came in with a leg kick and I uh, checked it and he hurt his leg. So like, <laughs> so this was like. No more leg kicks. So they can't. They're, they're, they're just, the so I started doing an MMA tournament. I ended doing an American kickboxing tournament, and I got I got second yeah. place. It was very controversial because at that point we weren't allowed to hit hard to the face. Yeah. We were we were so we were just kind of like Kukichi style light contact, just going back That's and cool. forth, exhausted. Right. But yeah, so okay. so that experience showed me that Kaji Kimbo can work in MMA. And then when I did my first real sport, my first quote unquote cage fight, the limited rules I lost. Um, I read the rule book. It was out here in Japan and it was kind of Shuto rules where you weren't allowed. Once it hit the ground, it was pretty much all grappling. Okay. Those are the rules. And I lost for the first time. I had a definitive loss in my fighting career. Yeah, um not by judgment by an arm bar and i really couldn't figure out how to get out of it without hitting him so that's when i decided to go grappling like learn a lot i started really studying grappling right and um ended up in a catch wrestling i i joined another fight club and that guy did catch wrestling and he came from an mma school that came from the sakubara lineage 
mm-hmm. of uh, the Gracie Killer, <laughs> as they as they called him. He came from that kind of lineage, so he taught me a lot of catch wrestling. And then I came back to that school that was going to be remained un, unnamed, <laughs> that we will rename, not mentioning, because I still trained there. I went back to that school to start learning gi jiu-jitsu. So now my program, my program to answer your question about, well, what is Kajukembo for you, was everything my instructor taught me and the things that he didn't. Because I realized that nowadays, first of all, I'm in Japan. Not that many two-on-ones happening in Japan. There's not that much violence happening in Japan. I still love doing the two-on-ones and combatives. I still do it. But a lot of the guys coming in want to do MMA. They're going to do the same kind of MMA I did, that kind of rule set. You're not allowed to strike on the ground. So I started looking at that and saying, okay, first of all, I need to ask my students, what do they need? What what are you here for? Mm -hmm. What's your goal? Because as a Kaju Kimbo guy, I just want to match your goal. I'm going to show you a lot of stuff. But if there's a specific goal that you have in mind, like sport oriented goal, we need to focus on that. So I'll show you all the basics and everything. But then after class or before class, we're going to focus on your sport, whether it's kickboxing, K1 rules or MMA or shooto or no gi grappling or gi grappling. I've learned enough out of all these things that I can't I'm confident to teach you to get you into competition if that's what you want. Talking to Hackleman recently, I've changed my school between the Kaju Kembo students who are learning everything I learned plus what I didn't in that one hour. And then my fight team. Those are two okay. different things. My fight team has to be part of the Kaju Kembo program. I didn't make that rule. I didn't want to become a quote unquote MMA coach right. who just like, sits yeah. there and holds the mitts. I didn't want to be that guy. I don't, I don't, I don't want to put that kind of time in. If other guys do, that's great. They can do that if they want. Mm-hmm. But Everybody has to join the Kaju Kimbo program where they're going to learn the acronym, exactly the acronym. And it's going to be, for me, a typical program is going to have some basics in karate, a karate warm up. Next, we're going to do some, uh, in my, the way I flow my class, a karate warm up. When I go through the basics, I say karate and I shouldn't say that in Japan. <laughs> I really shouldn't say that in Japan. Because really? karate has very specific rules, even from America, even American karate isn't what they're doing out here. It's very different. So okay. I tell the guys, hey, if you come from a karate background, I'm telling you right now, we're doing front kicks. Um, the round, front kick is okay. Front kick is universal in every art. It's the roundhouse kick. That's not roundhouse kick is different from Muay Thai. It's yeah. different for it's different for Kyukushin karate. It's different for Okinawan karate. Right. It's different for Taekwondo. And it's different for sure. It's different for sure. So I also tell the guys, hey, just pick a roundhouse kick. <laughs> I don't care. Okay. Pick one. Yeah. Does it work for you in sparring? That's the only thing I care about. Okay. If you're doing some roundhouse kick that you can't pull off in sparring, right. then please check a different one. So I say karate basics, but really what I mean is stand ups from a karate perspective. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we do a kickboxing drill, a stand-up drill that mm-hmm. can be applied to either MMA or kickboxing. And if you're, if they're doing kickboxing, I'll say, okay, no ridge hand, do an overhand instead. And I'll do little adjustments to their sport. Then self-defense. The self-defense is going to be self-defense. It's going to be what I learned. It's going to be uh, uh, some striking, a takedown, a ground and pound. Uh, no submissions, a break. We don't submit, we break because it's self-defense. So you're gonna you're okay. gonna do a you're gonna do some sort of break, break a small, you know, break an arm, break a leg, right. strike some more and go away. Uh then the then the kung fu, the kung fu is there. I'd say the, the kung fu is there because of the some of the winch on influence for the pairing. <clears throat> and there's also kung fu forms later. I do forms, there's forms. Ah. Some Kaju Kembo guys are not doing forms anymore. Okay. It's another thing. The forms are very specific to your school and your lineage. I do have forms in there because, and I was telling this to my student yesterday, I don't know what you're going to do when you're done with the program. When you're done with the program, maybe you want to open that school. Maybe I have a guy from England. Maybe you're going to want to go back to England and put karate on your window, right? Mm-hmm. And if you do that, then the first thing they're going to have, they're going to want you to do, the local karate guys are going to want you to compete at their tournament, and they're going to want to see a form. Here's some forms that you can present in that arena if that's what you're going to be doing, right. but they're not my focus. 
Okay. They were my instructors, but they're not my focus. Okay. Right. And then finally, the bow for boxing. I want to make sure everybody on their first day knows how to have a good jab, a good straight, a good hook, basic box, basic boxing techniques. Hands up. Okay. Is what I do. So like, then we do. Oh, and then we do grappling. So then, then we do a grappling. Uh, beginners are only doing grappling. I don't allow striking to avoid injuries. And we do something called, uh, we'll do one technique, usually positional change from side mount to mount, close guard to side mount. And then our sparring is going to be focused in that position. So three minutes of you and close guard trying to get out. The advanced ranks can do submissions. They're just doing anything they want. But I always tell them, talk to your partner if they if they want to do Kaji Kimbo sparring, I'm going to allow, I'm going to allow growing shots. Make sure they're wearing a cup. If you do hit the growing, make sure I don't want anyone to go to the hospital. Make sure it's light as mostly I'm always trying to prevent injury. Yeah. And then the MMA guys just do whatever MMA rules that they're, that they're playing with. So that's where I let the, I let the students decide what their focus is going to be for the grappling at that point. And then we have free okay. mat when they can do it or not. So that's my program. That's how okay. I, if you can listen to that and that's what my Kaji Kimbo is. Okay. So now remember when you tag it, right. And don't tag it. What is Kaju Kembo? <laughs> tag it. What is what is your essential structure for Kaju Kembo? Right. Okay. okay. All right. Now, um, the the most successful. I actually refrain from using the term commercial. I use the the term professional. So the most successful professional Kaju Kembo school, what's its secret of success? Do you well, think? Both, I'd say all the commercially successful ones are definitely family. Ah. So they are a very family oriented martial art. Got it. So unlike an MMA school, you're gonna walk in and you can see a bunch of guys testosterone out, shirtless, right. hitting. Right hitting everything right even if you walk into john hackleman's facility yeah you'll see some of those guys they're they're part of the fight team but you're gonna see a bunch of kids training mm -hmm. alongside adults wearing black geese that's interesting the really commercial successful ones that's what i see a right. bunch of families yeah. different ages different generations training together in black geese bowing in bowing out having that structure. Those are the okay. commercially, in America, those right. are the commercially successful schools. And I would say I would expand that internationally. I'm, so I'm, it's only me and one other guy in Japan. And we found immediately that does not work in Japan. Really? They already have karate. Andrew, okay. So if they, if a guy walks in and it looks like karate, but they already have a, paradigm of what karate is they right. will walk out right after that first lesson be like that is definitely not karate and it's not and if it looks anything like karate if i'm wearing a gi if i'm wearing a belt and they start thinking it's karate and then we start doing grappling that's immediately like whoosh, right so but that if you ask me to answer your question in america that works in i would say every other country but japan that works and you see, you'll see schools with like hundreds of students, again, kids to adults, um, doing kicks in horse stances, doing blocks, and then their sparring um, is all over the place. So like if, if I went to Hackleman school, you're going to see everything. You're going to see UFC fighters, and then you're also going to see maybe some, some kickboxers. Uh, the kids are going to be, are going to be competing in everything. They're going to be competing and and every all, you know you know the, the open tournaments they're going to be competing in any category that an open tournament in their local area has and that's the kind of competition they're doing so they're, they're going to be no gi gi they're going to be doing a lot of stuff and they'll be doing point sparring and they'll be doing continuous sparring right the stuff they'll be doing is everything but the way they look on the surface to any american it's a karate school as they walk in and then it's up to the instructor hackleman likes to say nope i call it hawaiian kempo with an M. Mm. So he'll say that to, you're doing Hawaiian Kempo with an M. And then later he starts telling them it's Kaju Kempo and he goes into the history of it. But as they walk in through that door, it's Hawaiian Kempo. And if they say, well, but I kind of want my kid to do forms. He's like, you know, there's a nice karate place down the street. 
<laughs> you can go there. And they'll teach you all the forms that you want to learn. I'm yeah. here to teach your kid how to how to defend themselves. How to, how not his his slogan is don't let anyone take your lunch money. I'm gonna make sure that nobody takes mm. your kid's lunch money. And that's, 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 that, his, that's have that slogan. on the wall. That's somewhere. I know that's somewhere. I, I I always see that. He's always saying it. He's always got it like a he's got like these um these little quotes and videos that, and that, that quotes on the bottom. So that, that's one of his quotes that he puts on there. And then <laughs> and then some of the other Kaja Kimbo guys, you'll walk in and they're um you know, their, their answer may be a little different, but you will see that people in black keys right. and fam and families, definitely right. families. Nice. Yeah. All right. I wonder where they got that from. I want to say, I don't know. I do. I, I, I'm going to say, I don't know. Right. It's, it takes it. I'm going to say, I don't know, but I can guess Originally, children were not allowed to treat in Kajakembo. Mm -hmm. And I've heard stories that the founder finally started letting in a 13-year-old and a few kids. And the kid, and then 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 kids program started, but that happened a little later. But I when I talk to the older generation of Kajakembo guys, a lot of these guys talk about how they were a teenager walking in and it was all adults. There was no kids, and they were the only kid. And then as that generation grew, they opened up the program to children. So something happened. Somebody, that's a great question. Somebody opened it up to children around around a little after it got founded. It, was, it would be my rough answer. I'm sure someone's gonna go in the comments right now and say it was <laughs> it was CGM. Da -da 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 -da. But that's great. <laughs> I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not a I'm, this, this is probably this is probably this is probably gonna be the first the first <laughs> podcast in which I actually go to read comments. <laughs> well, luckily nobody luckily nobody puts the comments on YouTube. All my people always put the comments on Facebook. Oh really? <laughs> um, yeah, all their all their arguments or anything that happens is usually okay. on Facebook. I hardly ever see it on YouTube. Oh, okay. Well well so. that's well that's another that's another commonality between Jeet Kune Do and and uh, and and Kaju Kembo because we get a ton of of comments on on the Jeet Kune Do pages. Uh, I mean, sometimes more than I care to uh, <laughs> be involved with. You know, yeah, like it's they too got, much. You know, it's too much. Got, it's got its controversy, man. It really does. I, I think every art does, right? Like, of course, it, especially when you go to their pages. Yeah, I'm sure JKD. Does JKD has something similar with people saying this is the JKD? This is the, this is the JKD. Oh, that's yeah. not the JKD. Oh yeah. What yeah. is JKD? Yeah. Th like but, that, but, yeah. But you know why that is? It's because humans are involved. <laughs> All right. If it was possible, see, if it was possible for the art to just exist without the humans, there'd be no problem. <laughs> but as soon as the humans get involved, right? <laughs> one group is like, no, 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 no. This is how you really do it. So it goes with the territory, right? Yeah. Like, but like I said to you before, I don't care what you do, what camp, what Jeet Kune Do camp you're in. Like, just be honorable with what you're doing. That's, that's my simple success secret, let's call it. Just be honorable with what you're doing. Yeah, well, do it with integrity. I think, I think that's going to be a great quote to end the second part of the podcast. So what I want to do is um, I normally ask my guests to say, not a quote, but ask them like what their like philosophy would be. But I think you just nailed it right there. So I think we're going to wrap, we're going to wrap it up with that. Okay. Um, for my listeners. I am so bad at branding that now, after two hours of doing a podcast, I'm going to ask you to subscribe to the show. <laughs> <laughs> if I haven't alienated you two hours ago, <laughs> if you only watched it for a minute, but please subscribe to this show. It really helps. Also, please check out. Oh, is there anything you want to promote? Um, so there's a, there's a new project that I'm working on. It's called a Jeet Kune Do Success Strategy. So if, if any, if any Jeet Kune Do people actually end up, you know, seeing this or whatever, and they haven't gotten it from me, uh, just email me. Or if any of the casual people want to talk, you know, um, 
ask me anything. Just email me at jkdrebel at gmail.com. If you are interested in the Jeet Kune Do Success Strategies program, uh, just put jkdss in the subject line of the email and just shoot that to me, jkdrebel at gmail.com. Uh, if you're in Florida and you want to see some JKD in action, uh, February 5th, first Saturday in February, I'm going to be in Inverness, Florida, in Central Florida. You can um, shoot me an email about that. Or actually, I do have it as, a, as an event on my Facebook page, uh, 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 Dwight Woods, on, uh, on Facebook. So just the, the, those two things. All right, sweet. All right. To my listeners and YouTube watchers, thank you for following the Social Jello with Angelo podcast, not the Kaju Kimbo podcast. That's a different podcast. Check it out. It's called KSDI Talk Story, ran by my my main brother, Glenn Fetticelli. We're different people. Check it out, and I'll catch you all later. Peace. <laughs>